Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. This morning, we're talking about cooperatives. The program is Everything Cooperative. You know, um, National Co-op Bank is sponsoring this program to try to give you the benefits of co-ops. Hopefully, some of you would want to develop your own co-ops. And this morning, we have the Cooperative Development Foundation Executive Director, Ms. Leslie Mead is on the program to help us talk about how you to develop co-ops. Good morning. Good morning, Vernon. How are you today? Oh, it's great. Thank you for having me on. Oh, thank you for joining us this morning. I know how busy you are. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the uh, Cooperative Development Foundation is or how it got started? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, the Cooperative Development Foundation, or CDF, has basically three functions. Um, one, it has a family of funds that makes grants and loans to cooperatives, cooperative organizations and groups organizing cooperatives um, with the intent to um, strengthen and expand the cooperative spe- sector. Um, we also host the uh, Cooperative Hall of Fame each year. Uh, which is held at the National Press Club, and it honors men and women who have made heroic contributions to cooperatives. And an upcoming event we're having October 4th is our annual uh, cooperative 5K race, which is at uh, Haynes Point and um, is a big fundraiser for the Cooperative Foundation. In recent years, we have been working to help improve wages and working conditions for direct care providers. We're in our fifth year of a grant from the USDA Rural Cooperative Development um, Program, and that supports our work. And we that, that program also receives funds from the MSC Fund and the CHS Fund. Got a lot on your plate. <laughs> Can, can you tell us a little bit more about the 5K run at Haynes Point on October the 4th? What time does that start? It starts at 8 a.m. So um, we everyone is welcome to come out. Um, you can register on our website, which is uh, www.cdf.coop. And um, all participants get a T-shirt. There's goodie bags, breakfast. Uh, the event is sponsored by uh, – it has – is heavily sponsored by the um, National Cooperative Bank, NCB, uh, as well as other um, supporters, uh, CoBank and uh, CHS Foundation, the National Cooperative Grocers Association. But um, NCB has been a long-time um, and consistent, generous supporter of the race, as well as the Cooperative Hall of Fame. So is it a is it a race that somebody's going to win? No. Well, <laughs> we do. <laughs> it, 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 everyone is welcome. Walkers, runners, joggers, st- people with strollers, and people walking dogs. It's really an opportunity for the general public and um, Washington-based uh, cooperative organizations to get together in an informal way to spend. Uh, you know, an enjoyable morning in the fall together and to kick off um, co-op month, which October, of course, is is co-op month. Yes, it is. How do you raise money here? You said this is a fundraiser. Yeah, so through sponsorships of the race. And NCB has been terrific in both sponsoring the race soliciting some of their vendors to sponsor the race. Then we have cooperative organizations who have traditionally supported CDF, who, who also sponsor the race. So it, it is the race sponsorships 
that that are the fundraiser here. <laughs> so you don't have the individuals like I am looking to see. That it seems like October fourth. There's a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> So I, w- I would love to participate in this. And I was thinking that the, you would may want everybody to sign up to also make a pledge to get their friends or something to get we money. We would love that. Um, and uh, when you sign up, uh, participants do register for the race. And there is, is a, a fee for participation um, as individuals. But if if we don't want that to be a hindrance to participation. So what is the fee? I believe it's $35. Okay, so you can pay the 35 or not and then come, and hopefully you could pay that or more. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah we're, we're, we're always happy to have more, <laughs> and we always put it to good use. Okay, putting it to good use. Um, so, okay, let's go back over this first. 5K run at Haynes Points. It starts at 8 a.m., and it's to raise money for a CDF, a uh, mm-hmm. Cooperative Development Fund. Um, how long does it take to do 5K if you're well, walking? For, for me or for, <laughs> okay, for, for you? That and would me. be a walker. Okay. <laughs> oh, I, I um, less than an hour, certainly. It's 3.1 miles. Okay, 3.1 miles. Uh, it's totally flat, so it's a stroll. As a matter of fact, it's flat and absolutely beautiful. It is really beautiful there. So if if you want a good, yeah, if you want just to see beauty, it would be great to come out. And at one point I was doing a 15-minute mile, so it would take me about 45 minutes. Okay. Okay. To an hour. <laughs> Are we going to see you there? I'm going to do my best. Okay. You know, the, the, and, and I've been telling people there's a D.C. co-op clinic on that day uh, from 8.30 to 3.30. Um and and so I was wanting to go to that also. So mm-hmm. that, that's the yeah. so maybe I come to the do the walk first and then go to this to the clinic. Um, okay, you said you put the money to get use. What do you put the money? What's the get use that you use the money for? Yeah. So so CDF is a a public charity with the mission to promote self help and mutual aid through cooperative enterprises. And we bring together funds and partners to meet community needs through the use of the cooperative model. So our fundraising primarily goes for it to to pay our overhead so that the rest of our our grant funding and these other funds that CDF manages, that that money can be paid out at in grants and through revolving loans to support cooperative development. So you're using this fundraising to pay for your overhead so that when you get grants, 100% or 99% of it can go toward whatever the grant was funded for. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's great because one of the problems with with granting and I've been in this in the world a lot is how much of it goes to administration and some places put too much of their money to pay people as opposed to doing whatever task that they were um, that they got the money to do for right, so. yeah yeah so so the our fundraising through the Hall of Fame and um, the race goes to cover uh, salaries and benefits for uh, CDF you know Good enough to be in that Hall of Fame. I like that a lot. I've been for now, I guess, four years, four or five years. Go to it because you get to meet other cooperators and see people that have just done great things. I haven't done anything good enough yet to be in it, but I would love to have, even if I'm never in it, I'd love to be able to do something well enough in this co-op world. And, and um, when when is the Hall of Fame? This the year? Hall of Fame is May 6th uh, okay. of next year, 2015, and that's always at the National Press Club, um, and it includes, as you know, a banquet and then an award celebration. And I, I just think it's really a wonderful event. Um, each of the inductees, there's usually uh, four inductees, and um, each a, a film of, of their their life and their cooperative careers um, are presented. Um, it, it's just really extraordinary. Starts off with pictures of them as a baby. And yeah. goes for <laughs> all those bad high school pictures and <laughs> Is there anywhere online to get those uh, films of the people? Because all four of the ones that won last year have been on the radio show. Yes. And- so 
so we have a, a website. It's um, www.heroes.coop, and all the films are up there. www.heroes.coop. Uh-huh, Fantastic. Okay. Thank you for that. And your web page, if, you, if anybody's looking to develop a co-op or if you want more information you, about CDF, you can go to www.cdf.coop. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I, I'd like the idea of this 5K run on Saturday morning, so I'm going to see if I can be there at, at 8 o'clock Saturday morning. That's, that's early for Saturday, too. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, but at least it gets over early, right? So you can go on with your day. All right. And what we what is is there a program at all, or is it just you start running? Well, the, the, they they gather, pick up your race packets with your t-shirts and your bib number, and then run and come back. And we have a little award ceremony and breakfast, and you know some presentations of of awards breakfast sounds good breakfast and a lot of the donated foods come from cooperatives so cabot cheese has donated cheese and equal exchange and uh organic valley uh, sunkist we have uh, a number of greenbelt uh food co-op can, uh, can you hold that for me um mm-hmm. leslie i um we need to take a break here, and I want to come back, and I want to focus on on those folks that you're talking about. But if anybody out there would like to call in with a question or a comment to myself or Ms. Mead, please call in at 1-800-450-7876. That's 1-800-450-7876. And when we come back, we're talking about Corporate Development Fund and they were are developed to do self-help and mutual aid through cooperative enterprises. And they're raising money to cover their administrative expenses so when they get grants, that grant money can go toward whatever the grant money was, was received for, so that more like 100% of the grant money can do what they need to do. We'll be right back with Ms. Leslie Mead, who's the executive director, and we'll talk more about what CDF does and why cooperative enterprises are a great way to solve community problems. We'll be right back. Please do not touch that dial. News updates on the web at woldcnews.com. WOL's motto is information is power. Information is power. And National Cooperative Bank is sponsoring this program to talk to you about co- and why cooperatives and the benefits of cooperatives. NCB's mission is to help cooperatives grow by supporting and being an advocate for Americans' cooperatives and their members, placing special emphasis on serving the needs of communities that are economically challenged. And this morning, we have Ms. Leslie Green, who's the Executive Director of Cooperative Development Foundation, and their um, mission is it's a self-help and mutual aid through cooperative enterprises. And when we were, when we just took the break, we were talking about the 5K run at Haines Point this coming Saturday, starting at 8 o'clock, and some of the people that sponsor it. Uh, so can we start back there to talk about some of the people that are sponsoring the 5K? Yeah, so, uh, of course, the National Cooperative Bank um, is a sponsor, Emmett, which um, is a, a law firm, um, Loeb and Loeb, uh, Auction.com, uh, the uh, CoBank, CHS, uh, the uh, National Grocers Cooperative Association um, are all uh, are all uh, sponsors of the race, and then Organic Valley has provided food for the race, as has um, Equal Exchange. REI has provided prizes and and, and gifts. So uh, there's a, a broad range of uh, co- cooperative organizations that are sponsoring or have provided things to support the race. Um, CUNA and CUNA Mutual, as well as um, National Rural Electric Cooperative are sponsors as well. Okay, so the reason I wanted to come back to this is because some of these names, people may not even know that they are co-op. Sure. Or they may not even know of them, 
And I am going to ask you now on air to help me get some of these people in the radio program. (laughs) (laughs) For instance, um, Cabot Cheese. Mm -hmm. What kind? Do you know anything about what kind of co-op this is? It's it it it's an agricultural co-op that is is uh, based in um, Vermont. Mm-hmm. You know, um, just for people out there, a co-op is any kind of business that you can think of can be a co-op. Mm-hmm. Uh, most so people don't know that. Um, but there's two basic kinds. Um, well, we talked about three mainly on this program. One is if the, if the uh, employees own the business, then it's called a worker co-op. And if the people that use the products and services own the business, then it is a consumer co-op. And uh, credit unions and housing co-ops are consumer co-ops, as as examples. Uh, and any kind of business could be a worker co-op. And then we have some co-ops, agricultural co-ops, farmers particularly, they will form purchasing co-ops um, where they will buy their products together that they need. They By buying in volume, they can get a lower price uh, and probably better distribution in terms so that they form just to buy together. And sometimes they'll form to sell their goods. Um, so they can that sell. That would be a producer co-op. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did not even know that term. So I'm, I love it when I learn. Yeah, so this would be a, a cooperative of dairy farmers who market their milk through um, Cabot. They own and control uh, the organization. Own and control. That's one of the reasons that. I would suggest what the question I asked before we took a break was why does the cooperative enterprise uh, work to help solve community problems? And I think one of the reasons is because the people that are in the co-op own and control it and they make the decisions. So tell me about REI. REI is a consumer cooperative uh, headquartered in uh, Seattle. I believe it's Recreation Equipment Inc., maybe. I don't know what the ice stands mm-hmm. for, but um, they uh, have uh, retail stores across the country, um, primarily outdoor clothing and, and outdoor supplies, that uh, camping and, and biking and that sort of thing. And they started out, I, I believe, as a, a cooperative of people who were mountain climbers and needed um access to equipment that they couldn't get. And over the years, uh, REI has expanded to include, um, you know, the, these outdoor retail stores. I knew nothing about REI until I started doing this this work on the, on the program. Uh, but they sound fascinating. Um, I, I went on the web to see if I could find what it stands for, but I don't see it real quick. So, so they have the stores and outdoor gear. So mm-hmm. these, these boots look nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Organic Valley? Organic Valley uh, it is a producer cooperative uh, based in, uh, again, an, uh, an agricultural producer cooperative based in um, uh, Wisconsin, but with members all over the country, and they uh, deal with uh, organic, da- they started out with organic dairy, but have um, spread out to other uh, types of, of crops and, and commodities. Uh, okay. A, a, f- a fairly new cooperative and quite successful. Well, I see, the, I see their name brand in lots of stores, but particularly in places like Whole Foods or... Mm-hmm. or Greenbelt. Mm-hmm. Oh, you mentioned Greenbelt earlier too. So is it the Greenbelt Grocers that's that's working yes. at the food co-op, or mm-hmm. the, or the credit union, or the daycare center, or? <laughs> yeah, what, what what co-op do you want to talk about in Greenbelt? Yeah, they they um, help with the, the the food, so it is the food co-op. Um, they also have a credit. I think they have seven co-ops, and they're looking to do two more. And um, the housing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um. Is Loeb and Loeb a co-op? No, they're a, a law firm. Okay. Okay. Um, equal Exchange. Equal Exchange is a worker co-op uh, based in Massachusetts, 
and they uh, were they they're an interesting uh, organization because they uh, work overseas in developing countries uh, with agricultural producers with cocoa and um, coffee, and they they work through local small local cooperatives overseas and then market their products in the form of coffee and chocolate bars and other things um, uh, throughout the United States and, and um, Canada. Hmm. And so so it's it's a worker cooperative working with other cooperatives. Fascinating. Okay. I would really love to talk to them, particularly their world uh, throughout the globe. Um, I asked a question, which I would like to get to now before break, is why does the cooperative enterprise uh, help to solve community problems? You said it's a self-help and mutual aid group, the CDF, which you use a cooperative enterprise, a cooperative model to solve community problems. Yeah. So, so um, I, I, I think that probably the most important aspect of that is that um, cooperatives are – it is a is are controlled by their members, and because of that, their their members have a voice in uh, what the cooperative does, and that often involves what the what the needs of the community are. How how is how is this co op helping us here where we live? So. Uh, for, for a food co-op, a food co-op gives members a voice in how the food they buy is produced, or a housing co-op allows members a voice in their community and how they're going to live and how uh, what the rules of their community are going to be. You know, it gets to the, the seven principles, and I like to bring them out <clears throat> almost every time on mm-hmm. the program. Uh, the seven principles of a co-op um, – the first one is volunteer and open membership. And the reason that's so important to me, because being African-American uh, and I'm 67 uh, in October, uh, co-op month, by the way. So <laughs> <laughs> so it is too often, and I remember well growing up in West Virginia, where I could not join. I couldn't even go to the swimming pool. Um, so that volunteer and open membership was not for African-Americans for a lot of places. Couldn't go down to the uh, Craig. Gretzky's five and ten cent store and sit at the counter to eat, so that it was not voluntary and it wasn't open membership. So that one, that's the first principle which I like a lot. And I've had uh, Roger Wilcox has not been on the program, but he was developing. Uh, I think his first co-op is in the forties, and he said that they wanted this volunteer and open membership up in Connecticut, and um, they couldn't get. Um, FHA approval for loans if they let blacks in, and they, they've they never gotten an FHA loan, they said. They just made it open and volunteer membership in, in the 40s, and they've had blacks, and they wanted the mixture. They wanted their co-op to look like um, what U.S. population looks like. And the second one is democratic membership control, um, democratic member control, so that the decisions are made democratically. Uh, and that's one of the major uh, – uh, tenants, the, the principle that I like also, and I think it's the reason why this this model helps to solve community problems because the members are the ones that end up having a say on what goes on in, in the in the in the uh, business. Members' economic participation, autonomy, and independence that they they these members have to have the autonomy and the independence to make decisions. And my favorite is number five, which is education, training, and information, that people have to be given the information. Information is power. And if they get that information and use it, then they can have the power to control their own destiny. So I love that number five. Um, Then there's cooperation among cooperatives, and that's exactly what this 5K run looks like, is the cooperatives are helping by sponsoring the, the 5K run this coming Saturday morning at 8 a.m. at Haynes Point that all of these co-ops are sponsoring it. So you got cooperation among cooperatives. And then the, the other major one is concern for the community. And because most co-ops are formed to solve some community problem, 
As a matter of fact, there was a gentleman by the name of Papa Sin who was last one of last year's um, inductees into the Hall of Fame. He said, if there's no community problem, then he said it on a radio program, if there's no community problem, then there's no need for a co-op. Okay. So he took it a little bit further that there is this concern for community and it is about solving community problems. So does that pretty much fit why this co-op model helps to solve community problems? <laughs> Certainly does, yeah. I, and it's always good to hear the uh, the, the, the principles um, repeated. And uh, how did you get involved in this co-op model? Because when I went to the business school, and I'll say the name at Stanford, um, it was not talked about this model. And listen, we got to take another break. So can you hold that answer until we we come back? Sure on how you got involved in co-ops. And if anybody else out there have a question or comment, please call in at 1-800-450-7876. We'll be right back. News updates on the web at woldcnews.com. Hey, welcome back, everybody, on this great day. we got rain outside, and our trees need them. Uh, so we're thankful for that. And we have Ms. Leslie Mead is on our program, who's the executive director of the Community uh, Cooperative Development Foundation, CDF. The National Co-op Bank is sponsoring this program. NCB's customers are cooperatives, such as grocery, wholesale co-ops, purchasing co-ops, or housing co-ops. Other customers share in the spirit of cooperation, driven by democratic organizing principles. They may, they may be Alaskan or Native American enterprises, which by their very nature are member-run and member-owned. Others may be community health centers or charter schools driven entirely by community needs. What they all have in common is a single fundamental principle. They have joined together cooperatively to meet personal, social, and our business needs. So co- uh, NCB has a a fairly large mission um, throughout the nation, and it does an extremely good job of satisfying that mission. And they are also one of the sponsors of the 5K Run, which is this Saturday at Haynes Point, starting at 8 a.m. Come out and walk it. Uh, I want to say with me. I'm 95% sure I will be there, uh, (laughs) Leslie, and... Uh, looking forward to the breakfast afterwards. That, that'll be the, <laughs> the motivator. <laughs> Get around the track. Um, can you tell us something about some of, well, I had told you I wanted to come back to something. What was that question? It was um, how I got involved yes. in cooperative. Thank yeah. You. Um, and you had said that when you were at Stanford that you, um, at business school, you had learned, weren't exposed to cooperatives. Um I uh, got involved with cooperatives because I um, got a job offer from the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, and um, I remember when I got the uh, letter to come for the interview, I was at Indiana University Law School, and I went to my uh, one of my professors, and I said, can you tell me anything about what a cooperative (laughs) is? Because I don't know. And he said, ah, I think they have an, some of them have an antitrust exemption. That was all that anybody at Indiana University at that time could tell me about cooperatives. So um, I, I worked for 13 years at the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives and learned a lot about cooperatives um, and uh, really became hooked on uh, you know, the, 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 the value of cooperatives. Um, at at the National Council, I started out in a lobbying capacity working on tax and antitrust issues um, and then moved into cooperative education and then finally um, took into cooperative philanthropy and, and, and co-op development. Antitrust, that's, I guess that's from the legal standpoint. I got into it, Leslie, by – I started a property management business here in the district and some of my first – um, clients, properties were co-ops, and I knew nothing about them. Mm-hmm. But having, I joined the Potomac Association of Housing Co-ops and then the National Association of Housing Co-ops, and I've learned a lot about them, and I've gotten hooked also. Okay, very much hooked on what a cooperative is and how it functions, and the benefits of them. 
And the values of a co-op based on the values of self-help, which you talked about, self-responsibility, democracy, equality, equity, and solidarity. In the tradition of their founders, the cooperative members believe in the ethical values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. And I get who could not get hooked on that. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Um, so the IU, uh, Bloomington, mm-hmm. part of my world life five years that I was at, at Columbus, Indiana. And, oh, yes. And mm-hmm. at Cummings Engine Company. And I got to travel the world uh, on their dime doing marketing studies, but still not co-ops. Everything was on a capitalistic model. Uh, mm-hmm. So um, can you talk a little bit about this co-op education piece? You said you worked on that after the um, your, your second go-around after the antitrust stuff? Yes, so I um, was the, the vice president of education for NCFC for a number of years, and NCFC at that time put on the National Institute of Cooperative Education, or Nice, and it was a big conference that um, was held usually in in the summer and and attracted you know several hundred uh, people to learn about cooperatives and had um, gone on I believe since the forties uh, and it was it, you know it began as really a major uh, effort to educate both the general public but but also people who were already involved in cooperatives in uh, best practices of management and in board uh, development and that sort of thing. You know, the reason I ask, I've, I've taught for 11 years in my career, and so education, like I said, a fifth principle is very important to me. And I've asked around a word, where might there be a Ph.D. in cooperative enterprise or cooperative business and there, there doesn't seem to be one. And then I said, okay, where are there four-year institutes? Where can you get a four-year degree in cooperative education? And so I'm going to ask you that. Do you know any place that, to get a I, bachelor's I, degree? I, there, I don't believe that there's an undergraduate degree in cooperative education. You know, there are places like the University of Wisconsin that that have courses, you know, pretty substantial courses in cooperatives. Um, uh, there is a master's degree program at St. Mary's University in um, Halifax, Nova Scotia, okay. that uh, many people, you know, uh, involved in the cooperative community have uh, attended, or a, a sizable number of people have attended. And they offer a master's degree? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so what I've decided to do, well, I went back to Stanford for my 35th reunion, maybe, <laughs> and and everybody's in their like 60 years old, or somewhere around that, 58 to 63 at that time, and and the and the uh, theme of it was what are you going to do with the next one third of your life, and so it's like okay, everybody in there is believing we're going to live to 90 years old, and what do you do? And I pondered that for a year or so, and I decided that what I'm going to do is promote co-ops and and see about creating a BS degree or some school, whether it's a Stanford or Howard, I taught five years at Howard, or start somewhere else like with um, um, the Federation of Southern Co-ops has a, a, a location in Epps, Alabama, where they do certification kinds of things. But where might we be and may, will there be enough demand for a two-year perhaps starting and then maybe a four-year a degree in cooperative education because it's much more than business. It's the whole social aspect of it um, and how these groups can, my experience, and I'm, I'm talking more than you right now, but my experience, Leslie, has been I'm in boardrooms with people that more often than not will have a high school degree. Sure. But yet they can make very, very they can make great decisions if you give them the information. They they really make very good, very um, you know, like information is power, um, and they they make decisions that are good for the group. And that's the other reason I got hooked on co-ops. It's not the individual; it, it's the group. Um, and so my third is promote co-ops, educate uh, about uh, see about getting some more education in a formal way, and then development of more co-ops. That's what I want to do in the next 30 years of my life. Sounds like a good goal. Yeah. Yeah. 
So um, can you tell us in my, in my, in my world of development, of uh, what kinds of funding do you do, uh, the, the Corporate Development Foundation? What, what kinds of um, funds do you have to help development? Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. So the Cooperative Foundation has a, a family of funds that um, it's accumulated over the years uh, that, that focus on particular types of cooperatives. For, for instance, we have the Bowers Fund, which um, gives support for board and staff training for food cooperatives. Um, some of the Bowers Fund money goes specifically to training uh, of startup cooperative members and, and staff and boards and others for existing cooperatives. Uh, we, food, but, but targeted at food cooperatives. Mm -hmm. We have the Cagua Fund, which um, is a revolving loan fund to provide uh, develop, uh, capital for to purchase and rehabilitate housing cooperatives at schools, so student housing cooperatives. Um, the and, and what's, MS, the, what's the name? Is K A G A W A? Uh huh. Okay. Um, and then we have the MSC fund, which is uh, targeted at finding solutions to issues faced by rural seniors, uh, especially uh, revolving affordable, involving affordable housing and um, high quality, consistent home care and and uh, and, and health care. What, does this MSC work with your Senior Resource Center? It does. Um, so, so the Senior Resource Center uh, is is partially funded through a grant by USDA, um, the Rural Cooperative Development Foundation, and that grant also helps support the MSC Foundation. Um, okay. Th this year, or the the MSC fund. This year, the MSC fund um, provided a grant to uh, Rock USA. Are you familiar with them? Yeah, Mr. Bradley has been on the program. Great, Mr. yeah. Bradley. Yeah, and it's great, great interview with him. He's doing a lot of good work. Terrific uh, program where they convert privately owned rural, uh, privately owned um, manufactured housing parks to cooperatively owned communities. Um, and then we have, they have, MSC has given funds to support uh, Cooperative Care, which is a direct care cooperative based in Wisconsin. It's a worker owned cooperative, um, and Circle of Life, which is in uh, Bellingham, Washington. So a lot of work with, with, um, with, with, focusing on using cooperatives to solve the problems of seniors for, for the MSC fund. We also have a Sullivan fund, which provides uh, scholarships for people interested, uh, involved in cooperative communications. Um, and we have an emergency fund, which provides recovery money for cooperatives and co that have been involved in disasters. So help rebuilding the cooperative after a flood or some sort of a, a fire, a natural disaster. Uh, that that fund was very active um, after Hurricane Katrina. I, I knew it was also active after Hurricane Sandy, too, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, and then we have a Cooperative Innovations Fund, which is okay. – uh, involved in co-op co development both nationally and internationally and, and that fund um, primarily focuses on low resourced communities okay and with that low resource community we'll come right back um, to finish it the last segment already uh, the hour goes by real fast mm -hmm. but we'll be right back if anybody out there would have a question or comment please call in at 1-800-450-7876 that's 1-800-450-7876 and Ms. Leslie Mead uh, who's the executive director of the Corporate Development Fund will be foundation will be right back 
1450 WOL. This is Vernon Oaks talking to you about cooperatives, the benefits of co-ops. Miss um, Leslie Mead is our guest today, who is executive director of the Cooperative Development Foundation. We were just going over some of the f- funds that they have, um, and we, you finished talking about the Innovation Fund. That one I would like to see if I can get a something innovative to send in to you guys. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, that fund uh, is... is is in transition in terms of its mission. So um, now is a good time to, to come talk to us about that. Okay. And when you say international, I found it very interesting that you guys got started in 1944. Yes. Before yes. I was born. But with a mission to help um, revitalize Europe after the war. Is that correct? That's, Did I read that right? That, that's right. And um, the organization CARE came out of um, what was what was then called the Freedom Fund. Um, CDF was called the Freedom Fund at that point. And the organization CARE, uh, which continues to exist, um, uh, was started through that Freedom Fund. So CDF started out as um, the philanthropic arm of the Cooperative League of the USA. Okay. And for a number of years it had uh it it was it was part of um what is now NCBA uh and CLUSA. Uh, but in I believe the eighties it became uh its own I, I guess it was the nineties it became an independent organization has its own tax exemption um and um, is a is a public charity. So CARE stands for Cooperative for American Remittance of Europe to Europe. Yes. And uh, now it's to everywhere. <laughs> okay. Yes, right. Okay, not just Europe. All right. So um, the early, just a, I'm sorry, Tim, no, uh, the no. early years of CDF, a lot of its focus was international. Um, and in the 60s, it began to uh, do cooperative support domestic cooperative development. Okay, and I'm looking at your webpage. I see there's another fund called the Jim Jones Fund. Yes, and that that fund is a a, a real new fund that is going to support small housing cooperatives, uh, members and directors of small housing cooperatives to attend cooperative education activities. Well, I like to call Mr. Jones my friend, um, and he's been on the program also. He uh, has worked with student co-ops throughout the, uh, North America, and so I would. And there's no uh, co-ops in historically black colleges and universities, and so I'd love to see if we could get some housing co-ops. Uh, in that arena because housing is one of the larger expenses. And by working together, students can both learn how to work together and solve problems together. They can also uh, get their cost of housing and food down by working together. And so it's a, it's a great, great tool. I love to see more uh, student co-ops uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, so our CAGUA fund is the fund that provides uh, revolving loans to, for student housing cooperatives, both to, to uh, rehab them and to for the initial purchase. Okay, so that's the one I need to tell people to go to, and if they want training, go to the Jim Jones. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. All right. Any any other things that you have learned um, working in this cooperative world of? of particularly why it works, why this cooperative model works? Why the cooperative model works? I think that when people understand that they're so much, they have, they're stronger when they work together, um, it, it, it empowers them both to achieve, 
you know, their immediate goals is through a cooperative, but it also empowers them in the community to be more vocal about what they want government to provide, what they want society to provide. Um, co cooperatives are a really empowering tool. At Greenbelt uh, Homes, which is a is their housing co-op, in their in their um, lobby there was a sign that said, "Co-ops give people the tools to control their own destiny," and that's what it sounds like you just talked about. Um, they they get the tools, and that's normally through knowledge and informed information um, that they can go to government and say, "This is what we want," or they can say to society, "This is what we want." And they can also say what they what what they can do together to get what they want. Okay, absolutely. I, you know, worker cooperatives are such a good example of that. Um, in a worker cooperative, members actually have a voice about how the work's done and what what their hours are and what conditions uh, they work under. How much do they get paid? How much, well, how much they get paid or how much comes back to them, yes. Uh -huh. Can you speak to the how much comes back to them a minute? What is that about? Yeah, well, I mean, in, in, a, in a, a worker cooperative, like in any business, you know, there are expenses to the business. And so uh, workers, hit, when, when the, the profits of the company come in, they have to decide how much goes to the company to continue the business, to buy new equipment, to do advertising, and how much goes out in salaries so or, or, or to, to pay the workers. Um, so, you know, wor workers, co working, worker cooperatives cut out the middleman to, to some extent, um, but but there are still costs involved in running a business, and workers have a lot more say in what how how that money is going to be spent in a worker co-op. In doing this program, what I've what I've found out is that um, normally a, a co-op is formed to solve some community need, and when the workers come together and they make decisions, they can often provide the products or the service at a competitive, if not lower price. And they can often provide a product or service that's better than can be gotten out in the marketplace, as good as, if not better. Um, and that's because of all the things that you've just, you've just talked about. And they don't have to have a profit. Um, it's not profit motive. That's why sometimes in the housing co-ops, the rent is less in a, in a co-op than it is in an apartment building, particularly over time because you don't have to have the profit motive. And um, once people understand that they own it, that, that's an attitudinal change that mm -hmm. happens, but sometimes it takes a while. But once they get out of the, the renter mentality and the ownership mentality, then they take a lot better care of the, of the housing stock. Uh, so it doesn't cost as much to maintain it, and therefore they can get it at a, at a lower price. You know, I, I had somebody on the program from from West Virginia, from Appalachian. There's uh, there's something called Appalachian Region Commission that in Appalachia is like its own country within the U.S. There are 13 states that's involved in Appalachian, and West Virginia is the only state that's completely all of its counties are in Appalachia. But it's normally poor people have community; they help each other. Uh, often they're not not educated. Um, and I was trying to get them to understand this co-op model because, to me, that's a way of helping them to solve their their problems. And having grown up in Appalachia, it's, it can be very bad. So um, I guess I want to see if I can get some of the folks in Appalachia to reach out to you guys, too, to see if there are some businesses that they want to start or how you can help them get funded um, and get training. Sure. You know, the, there are cooperative development centers uh, throughout the United States, and those areas where a cooperative development center exists um, really strengthens 
the cooperative community because technical assistance is available for starting and and um, and expanding cooperative businesses. Uh, so that's a very valuable resource to tap into are these cooperative development centers. And I do not believe that I, I know there isn't any there isn't one in West Virginia, but but they do cross state lines. Um, now, in Mississippi, Alabama, in, in Appalachia goes all the way down and goes up through to New York in the 13 states. Uh, where would I go find who, where these corporate development centers are? Where, where's the place to go look for them? So I would look at cooper- yeah. the, the, the Cooperation Works website. And the, I believe almost all of the cooperative development centers are um, members of Cooperation Works. Okay, so if anybody else out there is looking to create a co-op, a business that's owned by the workers or owned by the people that use the business, then I would encourage you to go to to Cooperation Works website. And and we're at CDF. We're happy to help, uh, to talk to anyone who's interested. Uh, We can refer them to um, other resources that do direct cooperative uh, technical assistance. Okay, we have about a minute and a half left, so is there anything that you would like to say to the audience in closing? Well, I I certainly appreciate you having us on uh, the the program today and want to, again, encourage anyone who's listening to come out and uh, participate in the Co-op 5K race. Uh, Register on our website, uh, www.cdf.coop. And that is www.cdf.oop to go come and join us. Are you going to walk, Leslie? I am. Well, I'm going to have to work. I will (laughs) be there. Um, (laughs) I'll be walking, but probably not the the race uh, course. Uh Then I'm going to you can come and join me on the walk to uh, Saturday morning at 8 a.m. at Haynes Point. And Saturday morning is supposed to be 83 degrees, uh, zero chance of rain. So it looks like a great day for a walk. <laughs> and after the walk, around 9 o'clock, 9.30, we'll have breakfast and awards. What kind of awards? Oh, we have all kinds of, you know, a top fundraiser and and fastest team and a number of, of, of awards that really don't require <laughs> Much accomplishment. <laughs> um, yeah, and and also goodie bags with coupons and and uh, candy bars from Equal Exchange and that sort of thing. Leslie, thank you so very much. We're, we're celebrating in October, one year on the air, and that's Co-op Month. And um, we look forward everybody to join us. We have a great lineup for the month of October and Cooperative Month. Have a great, great, great day. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. News updates on the web at WOLDCnews.com.